This is Remember Guns. 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 what's great about sports this is what the greatest thing about sports is you play to win the game hello you play to win the game you don't play just to play it that's the great thing about sports you play to remember that guy the show where we mine our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players past and present i'm one of your hosts james and that's all for my post game presser let's see who's up next for media availability yes yeah, ready at the podium ready to step in and ready to answer whatever questions you may have. But first, I want to ask a few questions of our special guest today, the person who gifted Herm Edwards his most miraculous win at the Meadowlands. Please introduce yourself. So what, am I the Giants head coach from the 80s now? You are, you are Joe Pisarczyk, the quarterback, no. who right. failed to successfully hand off a ball. I was going to say, I'm, I'm not a Giants fan, so I know Herm from his Jets time. What a guy, although Arizona State might not think so. It is actually me, the very special guest Xavier, and not Herm Edwards. He's going to have to come on sometime later. We'd rather have you here, Xavier, because only you can tell me what is currently making memories for you right now. Oh, there, there, there's so much. But I think first I got to start with, do you hear that? It sounds like violin music, and that can mean only one thing. Is that Mr. Medicinal's music again? <laughs> no. It is time for another Cheated Their Way into the Olympics segment sponsored by Vanessa Mae Vanicorn. Wait, what? So I just read about a Albanian long jumper named Izmir Smolaj. Mr. Smolaj is currently in trouble and can face international bans for submitting false qualification information to get into the Tokyo Olympics last year. Apparently... He qualified as what's called like a universality qualification, where if you're not from one of the top countries, if you do enough, you can get one of like the last couple wild card bids. You know, Seemingly same thing that very much like our friend Vanessa May found yes. for. And so allegedly there was a competition in his native Albania where he won, setting a national long jump record of 8.16 meters, and that wasn't good enough to qualify under the Olympic standard, but it was good enough to qualify under the universality standard. And he's no slouch. He did win the 2017 European Indoor Championships, winning the first ever medal at track and field for the country of Albania. And he finished tied for 17th out of 32 competitors at the actual Olympics, beating an American and a bunch of other, like, strong competitors so he doesn't suck he just happened to possibly cheat his way into the olympics to start out with and always got to bring up the people who find ways to cheat their way into the olympics also always annoying anytime someone that seemingly is good enough to be in the olympics like cheats to get there it feels like when the astros cheated with the trash can you really didn't need to do that barry bonds is my yeah that argument like barry bonds you were a 40 40 baseball player before taking steroids, you simply didn't need it. As the, as the great disc jockey Khaled once said, you played yourself. It's not like he hadn't competed at the Olympics before. He was in the 2016 Olympics too. So I don't know if it was his idea or Albanian officials' ideas, but a guy who was good enough to go to the Olympics cheated to go to the Olympics. So I, I had to bring that up before, of course, pivoting into what we all have been watching it's the World Cup that makes us feel very dirty about supporting it, but it's so fucking good. There's nothing like it. Watching Croatia beat Brazil in penalties this morning after Brazil thinks they've won it in extra time. Watching the Netherlands score in the 11th minute of stoppage time. Dude. The fix was in. If they had won after leveling it with 11 minutes of stoppage time, the fix was absolutely going to be in. I would have been thing livid. The best thing about that free kick is that it's a free kick that I feel like should be tried way more often. I immediately flashed back to 2014 in the round of 16 USA versus Belgium game. USA was down 2-0. 10 minutes to go. Julian Green scores in the 115th minute, I believe. And then in stoppage time of extra time, the USA gets a free kick. And they tried that exact thing. And 
I believe it was Clint Dempsey, got the ball one-on-one -on -one with the keeper and missed. It wasn't, it wasn't Dempsey. I want to say it was like somebody who was like man bun adjacent. I've always thought that was a great idea and I would love to see it executed better because if everyone's thinking you're going to shoot, just pass it along the ground to someone else and they'll be wide open. And it worked. But unfortunately, the sporting gods were not with the Dutch as ex-Arsenal keeper Emmy Martinez continues to be really, really, really good in penalty shootouts. Now, after having won Messi the Copa America through his penalty heroics, he sends the Argentinians to the semifinals against Croatia. Just so good. It's so good. I'm really just happy to, once again, be powered by the blind ability of casuals who knew nothing but the biggest stars picking the teams that go deep. Well, I, I, that's what steered me wrong with Brazil. I mean, I was really what steered me wrong most with Brazil is that I thought they were going to play Bruno, but Brazil <laughs> doesn't want to talk about Bruno. So I don't really want to talk about Brazil anymore. I mean, they made it to Monday at least by the time the last episode released. You, but you did. Yeah. You called that shot. They just didn't make it to recording. We just didn't make it to recording. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'll use my making memories just as a continuation for this because shockingly, we, we did think the Sixers season was going to start, but they're still waiting. <laughs> We're still just waiting for that first game. They, there's rumors they may play the Lakers as we record on Friday evening, but those rumors are yet to be confirmed. It's going to be weird when it gets to like playoff contention time. Are they going to go by winning percentage? Because you simply won't have as many games played as so many of the other teams. Yeah, I think you use the the, the games back percentage uh, standard. So basically, if the Sixers were to go 10 and 0, then that would be equivalent to a team that is what, 46 and 36? So I think we're still looking at at least a six seed if we can get started by like March. Okay. Um, but, you know, a lot to be seen there. What, what, what's been a joy for me beyond just the play on the field in the world cup. I've been watching all of the games in Telemundo. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's just a far superior experience as a Spanish speaker. It's a far superior experience. And I have to believe, even if you do not understand a single word of what is being said, I think it's a better experience. But the one thing that I've really been enjoying is learning the Spanish names for some of these countries because a lot of them are, you know, pretty straightforward. Argentina, Argentina. Brazil, Brazil. England, we get a little fancy. Inglaterra. Inglaterra. But it still makes sense. The two that have been my favorite. First, I'll go back to when USA played Wales. I learned that the term for Wales in Spanish is Gales. Spelled exactly the same as Wales, but with a G instead of a W. And then today... I learned the Spanish name for the Netherlands. Now, much like in English, where you can go, oh, you can say Netherlands, you can say Holland. You can say Holanda, but that's not fun. What is fun is that you can say Países Bajos, which literally translates to lower countries. <laughs> they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are the low countries. That's what they are. <laughs> I'm in Belgium. Shout out to Germany also for Alemania. Yeah, Alemania from Germany, from Deutschland. I mean, Too really, bad you just... couldn't make it to the group stage like America. Estados Unidos. Estados yeah, Unidos. Uh, flick. Japan for Japan. Korea, obviously, that's another one that's pretty straightforward. But some of the, the names have just tickled me. And uh, the Países Bajos, a tough one for the Naranja for the Países Bajos, but... Either way, what an incredible tournament it's been so far. I think we have two more are going to be tomorrow, correct? So, I mean, the results will already be known as of the release of this episode. We're going we're gonna to see England try to bring it home. I don't know why they say bring it home when it hasn't been there in like 60 years. Um, going to score a hat trick and crush them. It's very possible. Although I don't think we're quite close enough yet for the best English heartbreak. I would love to see... A, to lose to Morocco. <laughs> I mean, just an extra time loss in the semis uh, where they, they score first and then give up two more in the rest of extra time. That seems yeah. about right. Uh, like beating France and losing to Morocco. Actually, no. I think it would be worse to lose to Portugal because after this whole Man U pissy bullshit from Ronaldo, if he then knocked them out in that capacity after they got past France, a country no. that they've literally had a hundred years war with. 
that's about as bad as it could go. It'd be great. But I do, I, I do want to see Morocco win because no African team has ever made the semis of the World Cup. So that would be, that would be cool to see. I, I love how it is truly, like you go back to 2010 was the South Africa World Cup, right? Yeah. The whole continent of Africa just throws its entire support behind whichever team is the last one standing. Like, it was in South Africa, but it was essentially a home game for Ghana uh, when mm-hmm. they played Uruguay in, in the quarters that year. So, I mean, there, there are the casuals like James who, who just, you know, gravitate towards the superstars. But that's the other thing about the casuals. We love those underdogs, baby. I did know enough to appreciate that Ghana got to celebrate Uruguay getting knocked out even though they were also knocked out for a grudge from eight years ago. Peak pettiness. It was incredibly good pettiness. Three whole World Cups since. And, yeah, fuck, uh, it was. I'm not bad. It is 2010. Goodness gracious. Wait a right. whole well, I mean, lot, Ghana. I mean, for, for us Americans, it's, it's harder to keep count because, I mean, the 2018 World Cup kind of just doesn't exist for us. But, I mean, all that... Aside, I don't know if you'd like to keep it going, James, for your making memories, or maybe there's there's a, a certain buzz in, in your rear uh, that might, might be speaking to you otherwise. Xavier, I have a feeling there's exactly one other thing that you want to say real quick. Well, it's, it's not official yet. Even the Padres have introduced Xander Bogarts, and we've seen him in a Padres shirt. Like, well, yeah, because Judge think- went vacation after he agreed to it. Yeah, but until he comes back and is actually like the signing, because of John Heyman's arson judge to the Giants tweet, which will go down in history and infamy and should probably cost him his job because, come on, man, that's brutal. I will not be fully ready to be happy about it until it's official. The one thing I would want to say is that there are some Yankees fans, not not a majority, but a vocal minority that are, we shouldn't pay this much money to someone who's going to be going into his late 30s. And I get that. I totally get that. But based on the contracts that we've seen, Trey Turner and Xander Bogarts are going to be paid until they're 41. Yeah. These contracts just happen now. And if you're a team like the Yankees that has more money than God, everyone says, oh, if you if we, they spend all this money, they'll raise prices on their on the, on the consumers. They're going to do that anyway. That has nothing to do with it. If they could spend no money and raise money on ticket prices and food and concessions, let them spend money. If any team can afford to be paying 37-year-old Aaron Judge $40 million for hitting 230 with 20 home runs, it's the Yankees. I just want to say the dumbest commentary around this whole Judge discussion. Did you guys see what I think it was Tom Verducci said? talking about it's not really smart to give a contract to somebody who weighs over 260 pounds because there's only one person to hit a home run after the age of 36 while weighing 265 or more pounds uh would either of you care to guess who that is prince fielder no that's a fielder that old you're thinking the wrong position bartolo cologne bartolo cologne bartolo cologne my goodness but I just I hated the comparison by Tom Verducci because it is so disingenuous. It's like like you know like the meme where there's like the tall thin glass and then there's like mm. the short wide one and they pour the liquid between and you ask the kid the point and like oh which yeah. one has more and he still points to the tall one. The difference in the bodies of Aaron Judge and Bartolo Colon. You might get the same raw number of weight at the end. There's quite a difference between those two bodies. And I'm not here to body shame or to fat shame or anything. Bartolo Colon is fantastic. I love him. I'm so glad that he exists. But when we're talking about maintaining physical fitness into the late 30s, I'm going to take the guy that is yoked and hits baseballs 500 feet whenever he wants. I just will. I'm sorry. Couldn't agree more. It's a good use of money. Bryce Harper's contract looks like a bargain now. I'm sure Aaron Judge's will in a couple of years. Before we continue to talk about baseball, hey, Brittany Griner's back. That's incredible. Anyone who's trying to equivocate about this action is an absolute asshole. This person was captured in Russia for a crime that is supposed to be at most two weeks. I was held there for nine months and gets to be home now. That's ex- just exclusively good. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just a simply perfectly good thing. Also, uh, I flamed Micah Parsons for his initial statement, but he did make a very good apology afterwards 
acknowledge the fact that he spoke without understanding the whole situation. So shout out to someone actually admitting that they were wrong and that they shouldn't immediately tweet stupid shit after something like this happens. My go birds will not allow me to agree with that statement, Xavier. <laughs> you can still call him Pass Rush Limbaugh. He did atrocious things to people. Okay, then you can call him Pass Rush Limbaugh or Maga Parsons or whatever you would like. I, I do like people having good actual apologies. As a concept, yes, but fuck Dallas. <laughs> Well, speaking of apologies and speaking about the winter meetings, you know who owes me an apology? Mike Elias. Have you all heard about the, uh, the big Orioles move this offseason? No, you haven't, because there fucking isn't one. Oof. All we have, finally deals for Franchi Cordero, Nomar Mazzara, Josh Lester, and Ofredi Gomez. Don't worry, though, guys. Don't worry. We've got some reinforcements for the rotation. Say hello to Kyle Gibson for a year. Obviously for a year, because the next multi-year free agent deal that Mike Elias gives out to a player will be the very first one he's ever given to any player for this franchise. Everybody else goes and gets DeGrom and Verlander, or even Jamison Tyon and Jose Quintana and Taiwan Walker. Anyone, just anyone. I just want you to get any player and add him to the roster. And there are currently... A lot of Orioles fans are like, oh, you got to trust him. He knows what he's doing. I'm like, sure, we have drafted pretty well. But right now, the list of free agents that Michael Elias has signed include Nate Carnes, Dan Straley, Jose Iglesias, Freddie Galvis, Michael Franco, Matt Harvey, Robinson Trinos, Chris Owings, and Rugnet Odor. Those are the free agents that keep getting brought into this franchise. Welcome, Kyle Gibson, to an illustrious group. I'm... I'm, I'm less frustrated by what Mike Elias is doing to the Orioles, which is, you know, allowing the Angelos family to just treat them as a money sink. But beyond that, he's also just treating us really, really stupidly. He's just fucking rude to the fan base to pretend like he didn't say, like, look, he wants to go back and say, oh, you know, you, you could have uh, somewhat misinterpreted the liftoff comment that he had during this season after the trade deadline, where he sent out the beloved 10-year veteran of the franchise that had survived cancer with us. It's like, oh, don't worry about it, because we're going to significantly escalate payroll this offseason. And honestly, the innings eater pitcher that we have is making less money than the innings eating pitcher we had last year in Jordan Lyles. We didn't even escalate payroll with the one major league free agent that he signed. And whatever you want to say it's going to be for arbitration extensions, where is Adley Rutschman's extension? He's going to be 25 this season. He is going to sign his first free agency contract if you don't do anything, which I'm becoming almost certain that he's not going to, until he's 30 years old. He's getting to 30 and he didn't get offered an extension by his hometown team. There's no fucking way he's resigning. So the question is starting to become, do we think Michael Elias is going to trade Adley Rutschman in the final year before a free agency? Or does he try and move him with a full year left on his contract? That way he can get an extra double A pitcher coming off a of fucking Tommy John surgery or something added to the deal. I am just so tired of this asshole pretending like he's the smartest goddamn person in the room and acting like we're all a bunch of idiots for wanting the team that we spend six months a year for all of our lives, not just since 2018, just wanting to be like kind of good and pleasant to watch at Camden Yards. I hate you, Michael Elias. I hate you. Maybe I'll eat crow later this offseason. Maybe you'll go out and sign Carlos Correa or Carlos Rodon. Maybe we're not having smoke blown up our ass by Scott Boris when he says he's talking to you constantly. But I'm pretty confident that's not going to happen. I hate you. I love James rants, but I hope that for, for James's sake, they are wrong. And that within the next three months, you have Carlos Correa, Kodai Senga, and Shohei Otani trade. Of all, I would love Kodai Senga, honestly. All I could think as you were going through that rant is he, he is your Matt Klentak right now. Like everything you said applies to the Matt Klentak era. So all I have to say about that is don't worry. After Dave Dombrowski has completely gutted our minor league system to push all the chips in, he will leave. And I think he'll just go South 95 a little bit. And I think he'll end up in Baltimore. So you will have a contender soon enough. You just need to get away from your Matt Klentak. Like, I know that you try to tell me to trust the process, and I know that you have every right to say that you've gone through an excruciating process. And again, 
the minor league system's great. And we have a team that won 83 games last year and probably will win more with just the 40 man roster that it has. If you extrapolate full seasons of Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman, which is why it's so infuriating when the GM comes out and says, you know, when you look at this next season, I don't think you can really chart a course where we win this division. There's no reason to think that honestly, if you added a couple solid major league pieces to the team that you already have, you probably could contend for the AL East this year. It's a pretty wide open division. And it's just, you know, why are you saying that? Why do you want us to come support you with this team? Why do you want other players to see this franchise as something they want to be a part of while you're talking about it that way? If he would just shut up, maybe I wouldn't be so frustrated, but he's found it incredibly hard to not keep talking constantly this last week as he did nothing. I do also want to give a shout out to Justin Tucker. The next time he makes a field goal or any way that he gets three points, he'll be the leading all-time scorer for the Ravens over Matt Stover. And that's the only thing that we need to talk about related to the Ravens. Hey, Deshaun Jackson's got that burst back. <laughs> Deshaun fucking Jackson. It, it's the most horribly perfect player that we could have added halfway through this season. I did love after his debut against the Jaguars, like he he posted, I think, five separate Instagram videos of his 60 yard catch in the loss, all with increasingly like dramatic and petty captions like they thought they could write me off. They never knew. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, hey, buddy. You lost. We wasted probably the last great Deshaun Jackson catch of his career. Until his hamstrings just disintegrate into nothingness and create a black hole in the middle of MT Bank Stadium. And speaking of disintegrating hamstrings... You took the words right out of my mouth, Savior. Couldn't have done it more perfectly. Hey, folks, if you're not one of the people that personally knows all of us, we've alluded to it a little bit. I got hit by a truck recently, and I've had injuries on the mind since then, I think, understandably. It being my time to choose the category this week after my successful litigation for our girl Mary Whipple last week. I wanted to talk about injuries because it is, we don't like to think about it too much, but they're one of the biggest sources of major inflection points in an athlete's career, in a team's fortunes, in the fortunes of a franchise or city that'll ever happen. And there are some injuries that'll linger with you forever. It'll be in the description text, but hey, we'll go ahead and say, warning, there's probably going to be some unpleasant discussions of stuff every once in a while. We'll give you a heads up. I'm going to talk about one such injury that will never leave my mind. And it is the one that happened to one Clint Malarchuk. That one's nasty. Okay, I, I may have to close my ears as someone who is very squeamish about blood. That one is probably... Like, I look back, and I saw a lot of things on the internet. Before my- <laughs> <laughs> that we should not have seen. <laughs> but the most jarring is that, like, you know, some of those, you know, you get what you deserve. You go on dark places of the internet, and you find some stuff. I remember the, the first, like, time I saw Clint Larchuk's injury, I was just watching, like, ESPN at, like, 2 yeah. p.m., and they were like, I'm, I don't want to – I'm not going to spoil. But no, it's, it's, yeah, it's- we'll leave it at that, but it's the kind of thing that – when you hear it, you may be surprised to learn still gets aired on ESPN sometimes. But let's take things back to where it all begins for Clint Malarchuk in Grand Prairie, Alberta. Clint Malarchuk, we'll talk about later, is a goalie. And he was probably always destined to be a hockey player. Both sides of his family, very, very into winter sports. His maternal grandfather, Leonard Henning, is actually one of the very first speed skaters in the like prairies of Canada, as that's a sport that's kind of catching on there in the 1910s and 1920s. And after that, he starts coaching hockey. His son, Max Henning, pretty good local hockey player in that scene. And through hockey, Max Henning will meet Mike Malarchuk, playing goalie in these same leagues with him. And when Max and Mike meet, that also leads to Mike Malarchuk meeting Gene Jones, Max Henning's sister. Mike and Gene get married. They start having a family. In 53, they have their first child, son Garth. In 54, they have their daughter, Terry. And then seven years later, on May 1st, 1961, Gene Malarchuk gives birth to their third and final child, Clint Malarchuk. In 67, the whole family, when Clint is six, moves to the Elmwood community outside of Edmonton. They go there initially so that Mike can get some more work, but another 
big benefit of this is they're now in an area that's got a much bigger hockey seat. Garth is like coaching the hockey at this point, and that is great for Clint, who is really starting to come into his own as a young goalie in this scene. But there is also some downsides to moving to Edmonton. Work for Mike dries up pretty darn quickly, and Mike unfortunately turns to the bottle after this and becomes, by all accounts, a pretty nasty alcoholic. This is around the time that Garth is getting old enough that he moves away, and Terry actually marries and also kind of moves out of the house, so it's mostly taking the abuse from this now kind of mean alcoholic, Mike Malarchuk, Clint and his mother, Jean, kind of banding together and, and surviving through this. The two of them become incredibly close. He is her rock. She is his rock. And they really get each other through a pretty rough time in their lives. Understandably, this also makes it difficult for him to continue to participate in hockey. We've said it here on this show, hockey is very expensive and they don't really have a lot of cash lying around. There are some ways to get around this. At least one time, he participates in this like litter pickup contest. Uh, it's a candy bar company that's sponsoring it. You pick up enough candy wrappers and turn those in, and it's called Save and Score. You get goalie or skating equipment if you turn in enough of these candy bar wrappers. <laughs> Another lucky break for them is there is this guy who's working in an equipment shop in Edmonton that they meet. Turns out that it's Ken Hitchcock, who is someday going to go on to be the fourth winningest coach in NHL history. He's just a guy that works at the department store and kind of likes the cut of Clint Malarchuk's jib, so he hooks them up with free hockey equipment. I like that because even when he became an incredibly successful coach, he absolutely has the look of just like, yeah, I'm, I'm just the guy I just showed up. They told me to tell the guys to skate around and put some pucks in nets and prevent the other team from doing the same, and you know, 40 years later, here I am. 40 years later, I've won more games than all but three coaches in the history of the sport. So that's how he's able to continue as a youth doing it long enough to get to the point where he's able to join the junior leagues with, by the way, a mask that his mother made for him because they were so poor. She had to like do the casting of the resin for the mask. So he takes that when he goes on to start playing in the Alberta Junior Hockey League at the age of 16 for the Fort Saskatchewan Traders, not traders like Benedict Arnold, traders like Joe. <laughs> you know joe so for two seasons with the traders he goes 59 24 and 2 in 85 games he's looking about four and a half goals per game but this is one of those junior leagues where like offense is very high four and a half goals is pretty darn respectable respectable enough for him to then immediately after the end of his 78 79 season with the ajhl go to the whl the western hockey league a slightly more prestigious junior league and get some work in with the portland winterhawks before getting some full seasons then. All the way until the 1981 draft. At this point, he's built enough of a junior career that with the 74th overall pick in the fourth round, the Quebec Nordiques decide they like what they see and they go ahead and draft little old Clint Malarchuk. He spends most of his next season in Fredericton, New Brunswick for the AHL affiliate, the Express. But in December, Quebec is pretty displeased with their current goalie at the time, Michael Blass. And they figure, you know what? Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and bring up that guy that just turned 20 that we drafted last <laughs> year and, and see how he does for a couple games. His first game is December 13th. He holds his own. It's a tie against, foreshadowing, the Buffalo Sabres in Buffalo. A 4-4 tie. Does allow in all four goals. His next game is against the defending and future Stanley Cup champions, the New York Islanders. The Quebec Nordiques play a pretty loose zone D to try and generate a lot of transition opportunities, and they do a decent job of scoring in this game. However, Clint Malarchuk faces 37 shots and lets 10 of them in, in a 10-7 loss to the New York Ooh, Islanders. That's, that's not great. It is not great. In fact, it is so bad that he is sent back down for the rest of the season to Fredericton. He will spend most of the next two years in Fredericton, except when like they need injury replacement. But then coming into 85-86, they set him up as the primary starter. It's like a 65-35 split with this beloved local hometown boy, Mario Gosselin. Because there's this guy, Mario Gosselin, who's born right outside Quebec City. And everyone loves him. Everyone's watched him growing up his whole career. They've seen him in juniors and all that. Uh, and both of them are about the same level. There is a constant goalie controversy during the point where Mike Millarchuk is a starter. It is almost as bad as like the mid 2010s Vancouver goalie controversy. Just never ending. Everyone's always asking for Mario Gosselin to start more over Clint Millarchuk. 
despite the fact that the Nordiques are doing pretty well. He goes 26, 12, and 4 in 85, 86. He's got an 895 save percentage, which again, for the era, pretty solid. He is fourth in Vizina voting this season. He only allows 3.21 goals a game, which adjusts nowadays to about 2.5. The next season, the Nordiques, who had won the division the year before, although they lost in the first round to the Whalers, they fall from first to fourth. And Malarchuk takes a lot of the blame for this. That's kind of bullshit, because he has almost the exact same goals against. They just score half a goal less per game the entire season. But because everyone loved Mario Goslin and because Clint Malarchuk just was the face of losses as the goalie, he takes all the blame. And so after that season, Quebec decides they've had enough of him. They send him in a package to the Capitals that offseason, which does include, among other things, the first round pick that is going to get used to draft Joe Sacic. So admittedly, it's a pretty good trade. Not for the bad. Not bad. Yeah, they, they make out pretty well for that. Washington, in fact, does not even hold on to Clint Malarchuk for particularly long. They probably regret that one because about a season and a half into his time, he, in March of 1989, gets traded back to the city where it all began. Except this time he's going to the home locker room when he goes to Buffalo as a member of the Sabres. If anyone does not want to hear the next couple bits, it'll probably be a, a few minutes here where we get into some nasty stuff. Give me a signal. I'll let you know. 16 days later, it is March 22nd, and the St. Louis Blues are in town. Nine minutes and 43 seconds into the first period, the Blues strike first. They're on the power play. They get a 1-0 lead, and that is still the score. Five minutes later, as Blues player Steve Tuttle collides with a defenseman for the Sabres, Uwe Krupp, who I learned, by the way, I'm going to take one second to talk about Uwe Krupp. Apparently, he's like the greatest German player in the history of hockey, and I had never heard of him about this before. So at some point, we will have to revisit Uwe Krupp. There's not a lot of German players. I mean, Dreisaitl is one of the very few that are in the league right now, so. Sure, it's, I knew it wasn't a big talent pool, but I thought I would have, like, heard of the guy that was the best. Anywho, Uwe Krupp, tussling with Steve Tuttle. Steve Tuttle goes completely ass up. And Clint Malarchuk recalls that while he did feel something like knock his mask, he does not remember any pain when Tuttle's skate blade slices his carotid artery. The artery that carries pretty much all of the blood to your head, to your face, to your brain. It is sliced. And he does quickly realize that something is wrong because he sees almost immediately the first spurt of blood go about five to six feet in front of him. Malarchuk immediately has two thoughts. First thinks, okay, I'm, I'm going to die. All right, cool. This is how I die. All right. Uh, his immediate thought after that was, if I'm going to die, I am not going to lay here on the ice. Because Clint knew his mother, Jean, was watching the game. She watched all of his game. And he was not going to accept the possibility of her seeing him die. So Clint Malarchuk stands up with his hand on his throat and with the help of a trainer starts skating off the ice. This trainer's name is Jim Pizzatelli. He is absolutely one of the heroes of this story. He was a Vietnam veteran. And so as soon as they get off the ice, which he is able to do of his own accord, he grabs gauze, Phil does, and Phil gets right down with his knee on his collarbone. This slows his pulse. It slows his breathing, keeps him alive as he also stays conscious both through this entire time and then the ambulance ride to Buffalo General Hospital. He's, in fact, joking with the EMTs during the ride that he's hoping he can make it back in time for the third period. <laughs> Play does resume in the arena, for what it's worth, once they find out that he's been stabilized in the hospital. Here are some statistics from that 2-1 win for the St. Louis Blues over the Buffalo Sabres. 11 fans in the stadium fainted at the sight of this. Two of them, in addition to those 11, suffered heart attacks. Three different players vomited on the ice. And Malarchuk lost about a liter and a half of blood from the six-inch gash in his neck, which required approximately 300 stitches. Okay, if you are now back with us, that's the last I'm going to talk about that particular wound. There Thank will you. be another wound later, but oh, that wound is done for now. <laughs> Something to know about Clint Malarchuk, he was referred to as the cowboy goalie. There's a couple reasons for this. One, he's a country boy. He's from the prairies of Canada, and he had a big country boy personality. He was a big locker room favorite. Everyone really loved his vibes. But another thing is he had recently started getting very into rodeo in the off seasons. And he talks about this when he talks about how he treated his recovery. 
he would see rodeo guys, you know, get right back up after falling off a bull. And that toughness was very ingrained in him, whether that's a good or bad thing is your mileage may vary, but Malarchuk two days later went back to the arena. He did not suit up this day, but he did drop the puck and receive, you know, standing ovation and stick taps from both his team and the sold out crowd and the visiting Vancouver Canucks. He only waited 10 days before he put the pads back on. 10 days after this happened. That's he psychopathic. Up. It's insane. And you want to know what he does before the game once he gets suited up? The first person he seeks out is the other goalie for the Sabres, Jacques Cloutier. And he goes and apologizes to him for having to play in a bloodstained crease that night. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's two ways to approach traumatic injury. And I, I prefer Clint's way, which is just incredible self-deprecation. I think that's just the best way to get through it. Well, and there's, there's another thing that can help, and that's winning. With five minutes and 28 seconds left in the third period, Jacques Cloutier had started the game. They bring in Clint Malarchuk, a man who 10 days ago lost a leader nut on this ice. He blocks the only shot that he faces during that time, and Buffalo gets the win over the Quebec Nordiques, the losing goalie that evening. Mario Goslin. It's so creepy as a coincidence. It, it terrifying. <laughs> he does make a playoff appearance that year. Gives up five in the game two loss. Jacques Cloutier gets all of the other games in this five game loss to the Boston Bruins. And admittedly, things don't go particularly well for his NHL and AHL career after that. He is haunted. He talks about how even the first night when he was in the hospital, he already started having like this vision of a skate just flying at him all the time. And it really messed him up. And he went to go try and seek help. He got diagnosed with OCD. But not PTSD? I mean, also some PTSD, but like OCD was something that they were treating him as having had his entire life. Okay. So he started what would go on for many years to be a pretty extensive medication regimen, which is at times kind of mocked by players on his team, players on other teams, especially. This is at a time where hockey's not super great about mental health. So he's getting some shit about this and it sends him into some substance abuse issues. But a lifeline is extended to him at one point once he's kind of flamed out of the NHL and AHL after a couple more seasons. A coach that he had had in his days in Buffalo had recently taken a job in the International Hockey League. If you're not familiar with the International Hockey League, that's okay. It doesn't exist anymore. But it did exist during this time. And a team in San Diego existed called the Gulls. So his coach says, hey, come to San Diego, play with me on the Gulls, but also like come be in a place where we can try and get you some treatment where someone who cares about you can be the person that's largely in charge of you. He hooks him up with a psychiatrist named Steven Stahl who really helps him and gets to like reconnect with his kids from his previous two marriages. Has a third marriage to his wife, Joni. And things are looking up for him. In addition to that, he gets to keep playing hockey for a while. Plays with the goals for one season. And then there is an expansion team the next year in the IHL, the Las Vegas Thunder. We mentioned that he was a cowboy goalie. He was a big personality. The Thunder decide we're going to get this guy, Clint Malarchuk, who's in the IHL, but who's been a former NHL player. He's going to be our big celebrity marquee on this new expansion team. They love the cowboy goalie in Las Vegas. And they take that cowboy very literally. In his Las Vegas contract, he is explicitly given horses, partially in compensation for his play for the Las Vegas Thunder. Uh, he has them on his new ranch that he has out here. Life's going pretty well. He spends some of four years there with them before they retire his jersey in the rafters. And then he coaches with them for a little bit before spending one year coaching in the IHL, the Idaho Steelheads. And then the IHL folds. He continues to get some work with goaltending coach jobs now in the NHL, the Panthers and the Blue Jackets. This becomes particularly cromulent, we'll say, in 2008. In February of 2008, we won't go too into this. This is going to mention an injury for a moment. Richard Zednick of the Panthers suffers a very, very similar injury to Clint Malarchuk at the skate of his teammate Ali Jokinen. Pretty brutal. Everyone that is involved is fine eventually, and we're happy for that. But this being something very similar to Clint Malarchuk's injury, understandably, a lot of publications approach him. There's a really great ESPN write-up that talks to him at that time, and he speaks really eloquently about it. One of the first things that he is absolutely sure to point out that I appreciate hearing is 
there isn't just one victim in this. He talks about how terrible he feels for both Zednik and Jokinen because it's something that's going to haunt both of them for a very, very long time. He responds along those same lines. It's, it is kind of eerie how relevant the last line that he gives this ESPN article is at this time when he says, I can tell him from firsthand experience, it's something that never leaves you. I am now going to talk about another pretty rough injury that Clint Malarchuk suffers. It is not sports related, but this is going to get a little nasty for a little bit. Later that year, after he mentioned seeing a similar incident brought up a lot of feelings that he thought he had kind of made peace with. On October 7th, 2008, he's having a pretty bad mental health day after a year of a lot of those. Joni was out at the time with friends. They are still married at this time, but she's put up with a lot recently, and he knows that. She needed some time away. He rationally is okay with it, but he says he couldn't stop thinking that she was out with some guy. It was dumb, but it was just the thing that kept going through his mind. And so, in addition to a still extensive medication regimen that he's often taking nowadays and sometimes abusing, he also starts drinking beers that night. And he estimates he has about 20 to 25 of them along with his meds. And so, when Joni gets home that evening, she finds Clint sitting outside their barn with a rifle. And he places it under his jaw. Joni shortly thereafter calls 911. She is talking about how Clint got injured in a rabbit hunting incident. She very quickly comes clean to the cops that he had a suicide attempt and tried to blow his brains out. We say try because he does survive for this. And the reason she eventually comes clean is she wants to make sure that he gets the help for it. And he does. Clint Malarchuk is okay today. He is alive and well. This is definitely the nadir of his time. This is as low as it gets. But he was very haunted by this injury and it got brought back up and he wasn't sure how to make peace with it yet. But This does get him straightened back out. He goes through a number of substance abuse treatment programs and really kind of in the 2010s, as hockey starts talking about mental health a little bit more positively, in part due to the death by suicide of former Vancouver Canuck, Rick Rippian. He's one of the big veterans that is involved in these discussions about starting to make it okay for athletes and everyone to talk about some of the struggles that they face internally. He also continues to get work in the NHL during this time. He's with the Atlanta Thrashers in 2010. Just love any time I remember that Atlanta, like very recently, had an NHL team. After that, he goes to Calgary for the last couple of years. And in 2014, when he leaves them, that's the last official involvement that he's had with the NHL. He still, to this day, will tour and give talks and conferences about his battles with OCD, his battles with PTSD, his battles with substance abuse. And he is also. A very big rodeo fan still. He's living what he considers a pretty good life nowadays. You hear him talk about it. He and Joni are still married. And one last thing that I want to say about Clint Malarchuk, the last mention I could find of his mother, Jean, in 2012, she was still alive at 75. I can't get any straight answers to whether she still is now, but I don't think it's out of the question that at 85, the two of them are still together and able to still share that bond. Clint Malarchuk would be the first to say that his injury changed him. And it took a lot of time and hardship for him to come to peace with that change many years later. But one thing that never changed is that deep, deep down in Clint Malarchuk's soul, he forever remained a guy. A beautiful ending to that long winding story. I mean, what I love about it is like, I mean, it just speaks obviously to part of the human condition, right, is that healing is not linear, right? You're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have relapses, you're going to have things mm-hmm. that remind you of of trauma. And, you know, for, for better, for worse, I mean, all of that is present in, in, in the clinch story as you just laid it out. Absolutely. So eerie that he was on the bench when that happened with, uh, with Ole Jokinen. So to, to clarify, he was done with the Panthers at that point. He had moved on to work with Columbus. There are enough eerie things like how his career started in Buffalo before all of this and how his like last notable win was against the Nordiques and Goslin. Like we don't need to add more eerie, eerie coincidences. Well, I don't know which direction we should go now. Uh, you know what? So if it's always Diaz, darkest if, before the dawn. Yeah. Like if it, you're going dark, bring it on. Yeah, Diaz, if you want to, if, if yours is a little dark, maybe we should go with yours first and then we can finish on a slightly lighter note later. So I wouldn't say mine's particularly dark. It's just more gruesome. Now let's go with yours first and then 
My, my, mine is not gruesome. I can say that. It is not gruesome. Okay. Well, mine, mine is just very acutely gruesome. And without spoiling too much, it, it really just comes down to a singular incident. Everybody knows Monday Night Football. The whole world's tuning in. Everybody is hoping to see something great. And unfortunately, on one fateful Monday Night Football, we did see a leg bend the opposite direction of the way that it is supposed to bend. Now, most people are going to hear that and they're going to say, oh, yeah, you're talking about Lawrence Taylor when he rolled up Joe Theismann. That's not what I'm talking about. Interesting. There, there, there are two. Is, is it a different Washington quarterback? Because Pers- Alex Smith's leg like, also kind of did that. No, that's, that, that is true. It's thankfully, it's not a Washington quarterback. It is somebody that originally made his name not too far from the D.C. metro area. So this is a guy that served his country and served the Los Angeles Raiders thereafter. I'm talking about the 1986 fourth round pick of those Los Angeles Raiders, hailing from Jefferson City, Missouri. Perhaps the midshipman that came closest to winning a Heisman besides Roger Staubach. Talking about Napoleon Ardell McCallum. Okay. Never heard of him before, but that's easily a top 20 sports name that I've ever been told. No, that was what I was Napoleon McCallum. So, I mean, first of all, like it, there's something with the Napoleon that like does make you think like, you know, Napoleon Bonaparte, we're thinking military. He goes to play for Navy. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of good things there. But Napoleon Ardell McCallum, born October 6, 1963. So he's born in Jefferson City, Missouri, but he is largely raised in a suburb of Cincinnati uh, in Ohio uh, before he ultimately settles in Milford, Ohio where he attends Milford High School. Now, he is a two-way star for Milford. For the Eagles, his senior year, he runs for 1,625 yards and 17 touchdowns. Also along the way, intercepts 12 passes in that season. And we also need to keep in mind, this is back when the game was a lot more run-centric, especially at the high school level. So conservatively if he played 15 games he maybe saw 200 passes so he intercepts 12 of those uh go so birds. go birds <laughs> go birds and for those efforts he was named third team all ohio as a defensive back and he obviously gets a ton of attention because of those gaudy numbers he was recruited to play for a lot of the, the major powers of the time, or at least major conference teams. Syracuse wanted him to come play. Tennessee wanted him to come play for them. NC State also. All of these schools offer him a scholarship, but they're only offering it to him to play defensive back. Napoleon doesn't want anything to do with that. Napoleon wants to run the ball. And there's one place that would allow him to do that, and that would be the Naval Academy. So... He, he heads east. He heads across to Annapolis, Maryland, where he enrolls at the Naval Academy. And he initially is not a starting running back, but he is still in the rotation. Where he's really able to shine is on special teams. He's the main kick returner. He's the main punt returner from the second that he sets foot on campus. And he's really establishing himself, especially by the time that he gets to his junior year, where he is a consensus All-American playing at Navy. And this is still, Navy's still not a power anymore. Navy was absolutely a power in the 50s and 60s, but still a very reputable program. Are they Um, running the triple option yet at this point? So they're not running the triple option in its current iteration as it exists there. Paul Johnson came from Georgia Southern and was Navy's coach, I believe 2002 was the first year. And so that's still, and, now, and that's Ken Neomatololo was a disciple of Paul Johnson. So still a run-centric offense. The, the, the thing that the Naval Academy has always had to deal with and starts to become a thing by the 80s is you need to be able to pass like the fitness exam, right? For, <laughs> I can't for recruit linemen. So exactly. You're not going to get a 300-pound guy that's also going to be able to hit the cardio goals for the military program. So Pass blocking is not a thing. Pass blocking if holding was allowed and you were able to drag the guy down to you after he steams rolling, that could happen. So as I said, junior year, 
he makes consent to saw America. He's coming back for his senior year in 1984. Gets off to a good start. First game, racks up some serious numbers. In the second game, he suffers a horrific break to his ankle. And this is, believe it or not, not the injury that I'm going to, (laughs) that brought my attention to him. He breaks his ankle. He ends up missing the whole season. But the NCAA, as villainous as it may be, does have occasional moments where you do have to hand it to them. What they do is they grant the the medical red shirt to Napoleon McCallum. So he is able to come back for the 1985 season and has an excellent 1985 season. He would score two touchdowns in the Army Navy game that year, which is the only Army Navy game to be played at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. He would set two records during his Navy career. The first being a Navy record. He was the career rushing leader with 4,179 yards. This was held until 2015 when it was broken by Keenan Reynolds. And then the Ravens drafted him and never did a single goddamn thing with him. Do love Keenan Reynolds. Couldn't figure out how to make some kind of offensive weapon out of Keenan Reynolds. Always frustrated me a little bit. Which is remarkable uh, that they weren't able to pull that off. He would also set an NCAA record. Now, I mentioned earlier in his career and throughout his career, he would be a, a kick returner and a punt returner. So getting all those touches gives you a chance to rack up a ton of yardage. He would finish his career with 7,172 career all-purpose yards. So he leaves Navy as the record holder for that category. It has since been broken a few times. Would any of you care to guess who the current all-time NCAA all-purpose yardage leader is now? Oh, crap. Um, Did Cordell Patterson play four years? He did not. I'm is, gonna is, it, is it Lynch? It's not Lynch. I want you to think local. I want you to think basketball school. And I want you to think fairly recent. Ray Rice? No. Thank you for saying that so I didn't have to guess Ray Rice because I wanted to. I'm not going to get it. We discussed this guy during uh, one of our fantasy football episodes. We actually discussed him very recently, too, uh, during the John Runyon episode. Brian Westbrook. Brian Westbrook! Oh. Brian okay. Westbrook for the Villanova Wildcats currently holds that record. Uh, I, I was thinking FBS. So does that count? Well, we're still Division One, And again, it is the NCAA record. Funny enough, the most all-purpose plays in a career belongs to a player named Steve Bartolo. Played for Colorado State. Just learned that. So shout out Steve Bartolo. Maybe we'll do a deeper dive at some point. But for now, let's get it back to our, our man in the middle, our midship man, if you will. Napoleon McCallum. He would play in the Senior Bowl in 1986. He'd be named the MVP of that Senior Bowl, which is obviously a big opportunity for him to show that he can produce in front of NFL scouts. Part of the problem, though, is, as you may be aware, if if you remember the, the plight of David Robinson, if you remember with a lot of these naval and military athletes, there is a service requirement once you graduate. But an important caveat of this is that your military service does not preclude you from taking additional employment should it not interfere with your duties on base. So there's there's a couple of places that get an idea that they might be able to make something work with this. The first is actually, James, a team that's near and dear to your heart. The Baltimore Stars in 1986 draft Napoleon McCallum. And funny enough, they acquired this pick in a trade that they made with the San Antonio Gunslingers. Uh, <laughs> talk about pandering, baby. You've got two strong weeks of it now. Just elite pandering, and I thank Napoleon for doing that. But uh, the other team that drafts him is the Los Angeles Raiders. And this actually ends up working out very nicely because the Navy would assign Napoleon to the USS Peleliu, which is based in Long Beach, California. Reasonably close. to to LA. So he is able to head over there and his rookie year, he has a very successful rookie year. He is backing up Marcus Allen, of course, a Hall of Fame running back for the LA Raiders. So 
He's not going to get a ton of opportunities, but he is going to make the most of those opportunities when they come. And he's going to run for 536 yards his rookie season. So a good start. Like he can be the the, the complement to Marcus Allen. They know they're not going to have a major drop off uh, as long as he's backing him up. Um, the issue is going to be that according to Napoleon, the Navy didn't like too much that this guy is out here getting all the credit uh, for for you know being an athlete. He's not necessarily a, you know a keep his head down and you know military service kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're not too happy about that. So he gets reassigned the next year to the USS California, which sounds great, right? We're still in we're still in the same state. It's not going to be a problem. Uh, it's ported in Alameda, which again, pretty reasonably close. We can probably make this work. The issue is that the USS California is deployed into the Indian Ocean for three years. <laughs> so it's going to be pretty hard for Napoleon to get home uh, in time for the games. Um, so he is out of the NFL for the next three seasons. Uh, so 87, 88, 89. He's just floating around out in the Indian Ocean, um, waiting for a chance to get called back. His Ted <clears throat> Williams years. His Ted Williams years. No, that's a great way to put it. McCallum asserts to this day that this decision was made because of the attention that he received while playing for the Raiders. But, again, that, that military service requirement is not in perpetuity. It is only for four years post-graduation. So after those four years, we now arrive at 1990. He is done with his military service, and the Raiders are still going to welcome him back with open arms. Does he accumulate contract service time as he has military service time with the Raiders? So my understanding of it is that the contract is essentially placed on hold. So he signs a deal with the Raiders. He's unable to fulfill his end of the contract while on those military service years. So those are just missing years, for for lack of a better term. We come to 1990, he is able to rejoin. And the thing is, Marcus Allen went from a very good running back to the defending MVP and AP Offensive Player of the Year for the previous season in 1989. So what opportunities Napoleon did have, they are much fewer and farther between. The the total he puts up his rookie year would end up being his career high in rushing yards for a season. But... He's still able to find different ways to contribute. He gets more involved in special teams. He kind of becomes the the, the short yardage back. So, you know, if, if it's a third and one, we don't want Marcus Allen taking those hits necessarily. Napoleon, get in there, run physical, get the two yards. The pinnacle of his career as, as we come back is going to be a 1993 game in the playoffs where in the wild card matchup against the Denver Broncos and John Elway. He would rush for three touchdowns and helping to lead the Raiders to a victory. So knows his role, does it well, gets in the end zone. One other thing I want to mention as, as we expand the guy universe, the head coach of the Raiders when Napoleon returns is Art Shell. Yeah. Everybody's favorite Maryland Eastern Shore alumnus. So reunited with another guy. And we now go forward into the 1994 season. So we're coming off of this playoff run where he has the the, the three touchdown game against the Broncos. He's feeling good. And we're actually going to have a crossover here with another guy in the universe, somewhat adjacent. It's early in the, the, the first Monday night game of the 1994 season. The Raiders are at Candlestick Park to play against the San Francisco 49ers. And playing linebacker for the 49ers that evening is Ken Norton Jr. Ken Norton Jr. is, of course, the son of Ken Norton Sr., who claimed his last victory as a boxer against Randall Tex Cobb. Love it. It's six degrees of guy at this point. There are so many degrees of guy, and there is about to be... 180 degrees of bend in the incorrect direction on Ugh. left knee of one Napoleon McCallum. So there's uh, your warning. There is your warning. So thankfully, no no blood or... I was going to say gore. Depending on your definition of gore, there is some gore with this injury. But there is no blood. Basically, Napoleon plants his left foot in the ground 
the cleat gets somewhat stuck and the angle that he's getting hit at i mean basically just if you're if you're sitting at a chair right now your your knee is at a 90 degree angle imagine your lower leg is just this on the same plane but in the complete opposite direction this is what happens to napoleon he gets rolled up horrifically and first of all important to note while Ken Norton Jr. delivered the tackle because of the way that the bodies landed, Napoleon was actually on top of Ken Norton Jr. Because of how unstable the knee was and how concerned the doctors were, as they treat him on the field, Ken Norton Jr. is just still under him. He's they not will, allowed to move yet? <laughs> we cannot God. move. We cannot mess with this knee. It is so unstable. We need to like really stabilize it, get that air cast or the 1994 equivalent of it on that yeah. leg so he's just pinned under him i'm just gonna rack through the injuries that he suffers first of all a complete hyperextension of the left knee he ruptures an artery in that left knee he tears all three of those major ligaments that being the anterior the posterior and the medial cruciate ligaments in the knee his calf is torn off the bone Ew. His torn Oofa, off the bone. Doofa. And he also suffers nerve damage in that knee. Oh, does he? Oh, is there some nerve damage in that knee? I'm glad you went second. This is gruesome. So just about everything that you could hurt as related to a knee is hurt in this injury. I'm picturing the human equivalent of like the slowdown scenes where you wreck your car and burn out. No, it, it's, it is absolutely horrific. But Napoleon's an optimist as he's you know, discussing treatment plans and whatnot. He's like, look, I'm, I'm going to have a lengthy rehab, but I'm going to be back, right? Like, I'm going to be fine. The surgeon made it very clear in their first meeting. He said, there is no chance of you ever being cleared medically to play again. The surgeon had not seen leg injuries that severe previously, except for in car accidents. <laughs> and the surgeon warned him going into surgery, if this doesn't work the way that I hope it works, we may need to amputate. However, thankfully for Napoleon, the surgeon knew what he was doing. It is a successful surgery by most standards. Of course, as I mentioned, he's not able to return to playing, but does have a fully functional leg by everyday standards. Now he's able to walk without any major difficulties. Of course, thus ends the, the, the pro football career of Napoleon McCallum. But he still considers himself an athlete. He's still a competitor. To this day, he's still an avid golfer. Much less chance of traumatic leg injury in that sport, thankfully. Not zero. Not zero, but significantly less. There is always a chance, right? But Napoleon would still play a key role in the, in, in the direction of the Raiders franchise. He was one of the first people to set up a meeting between Mark Davis and the mayor of Las Vegas at the time, Carolyn Goodman, to start discussing the potential relocation of the then Oakland Raiders franchise to Las Vegas. Does this happen without Napoleon McCallum? Perhaps. But we know that in this universe, it happens largely because of a meeting that Napoleon McCallum is able to facilitate between Mark Davis and Carolyn Goodman. And uh, he also sets up further meetings, which would help secure the, well, we all hate this, public funds that were needed to secure the building of the Allegiant Stadium where the Las Vegas Raiders do play today. All stadiums should be paid for by the billionaires who own the teams. This is absolutely true, but much like his namesake, he understands what is necessary to expand an empire. and. In some capacity, I do respect it. Oh, he, he's true to the name. He's true to the game. He suffers a very traumatic injury. And I think, to me, he's always one of the greatest what-ifs because he had that really good rookie season. Yeah. Uh, where, where he runs for over 500 yards as a backup to Marcus Allen. If he is allowed to stay in training camp, have the benefits of a full offseason program, does he rise to the heights of a Marcus Allen? Does Marcus Allen go on to have the stats that would propel him to that MVP and ultimately the Hall of Fame? Would he have had stronger legs and not have had a horrific knee injury if he had been able to focus on football full-time? Granted, 
He was he was back in the league for about three four seasons before that happened. But nonetheless, I think it's it's a, it's an interesting point to consider. It's the Navy's fault. Listen, I'm more than happy to blame the U.S. military for a lot of things, and I think that Napoleon McCallum's injury is absolutely among those things. <laughs> so, a, a a tremendous what if scenario, but the one thing that is not an if and is a certainty is that Napoleon McCallum is a certified GUI guy. That was excellent. Phenomenal presentation. Absolutely horrific injury. And yeah, you really are pandering to me recently. And look, I'm flattered. What, what can I say? I'm just, I'm just gunslinging out here. Like I'm from San Antonio. What a spur of the moment thing for you to say. Ooh. All right. Well, before we encourage further booing from Xavier with our horrific puns, let's hear about this life-altering injury that is actually on a somewhat positive. Kind of, kind of chipper. Before we do that, let's go to the bathroom real quick. All right, everybody, good. So. You know, I know we're talking about injuries, but that doesn't mean we can't have a little fun. And what's more fun than talking about strange, non-sports-related injuries that didn't lead to lifelong harm or, you know, nearly dying? So the, the way you have my wheels spinning right now, like I'm thinking back, like somebody was like throwing sunflower seeds as a baseball player one time and like they ended up being out for the season because they fucked their elbow up. Like that's the vein you have me thinking in right now. You are very much on the right track Is it one of the silly spring training ones? Well, okay. So before I get into it, I do want to give a special shout out to uh, Kirk Broadfoot, who was a soccer player for Rangers in Scotland, who injured himself while poaching an egg in his microwave, where the liquid egg just jumped out of the microwave and scalded his face. So that's kind of the angle I was going for. Injuries like that. Okay. Where it's more funny. Where it's just the person is. being stupid to some extent. Kind of. And there's a lot of those in baseball. Like there was a guy who had night terrors about spiders and fell through a glass table. But, <laughs> you know, I want to talk about Joel Zamaya. Okay. So you might not remember Joel Zamaya now. You probably will in a little bit. Joel Zamaya was born November 9th, 1984 in Chula Vista, California, in the San Diego area. Grows up playing baseball and gets drafted out of high school as a 17-year-old in the 11th round, pick 320 overall of the 2002 draft by the Detroit Tigers. Yeah, it's picked pretty low because he had poor control of his off-speed pitches, but he did have something that most people did not have in 2002, especially 17-year-olds. He had a 100-mile-per-hour fastball. Oh, shit. Okay, that's way better than a car. The Tigers are like, all right, we can do something with this. And they were right, because by 2005, in 26 games across AA and AAA as a 20-year-old, Zamaya is pitching to a 2.74 ERA with 199 strikeouts and 151 innings. He is one of their top prospects, and it, it's looking great. So, in 2006, he gets called up to the bigs alongside... Hello, rookie, Justin Verlander. The fact that Verlander's still going. I know, it's insane. But so while Verlander gets put in the rotation, Tigers decide to put Zamaya in the bullpen as a middle reliever first. And he has a fantastic season. He pitches in 62 games, has a 6-3 and three record with one save, 1-9-4 ERA with 97 strikeouts and 83 innings as a 21-year-old. Fucking excellent. On July 3rd of that year, in a game against the A's, Zumaya, Verlander, and Fernando Rodney become the first trio of teammates to throw 100 miles per hour in the same game. They Fernando just... Rodney was hitting 100? Yes. This team is throwing gas. Like, a decade and a half before Kevin Cash had his, I got a whole stable of guys that throw 100. People were not throwing 100 at this point. So Zumaya remains a key member of the bullpen going into the playoffs. Uh, he appears in two games against the Yankees in the ALDS, and he's dominant. He strikes out A-Rod, makes him look silly on a 101-mile-per-hour fastball, records two scoreless innings with three strikeouts as the Tigers win the ALDS. Comes on in game one of the ALCS against the A's, 
and throws a pitch that gets recorded at 104.8 miles per hour, which is the fastest in MLB history at the time and the fastest until Aroldis Chapman came along. But then he gets sidelined after that for what they call a sore wrist, and he's out for the remainder of the series. He comes back for the World Series as the Tigers are facing off against the St. Louis Cardinals, but he's a lot less effective. He pitches in three games and records a loss in game four while giving up three runs and three innings with three walks and a wild pitch. He's just not not the same. And in a radio interview after the World Series, Tigers president, Dave Dombrowski, revealed that Zumaya's sore wrist in the playoffs was actually due to him playing too much Guitar Hero. He walked so that Kyler Murray could run. All right, wait. So is this Guitar Hero one? Guitar this is Hero Guitar. Two? This is Guitar Hero one. This is two thousand six. This is Guitar Hero one. Credit to him. He was ahead of the curve on the plastic peripheral craze. He got in on that early. So the team's doctors realized that his injury was quote more consistent with the action of a guitar player than a baseball pitcher. So they had to talk to him about it, where he admitted what he was doing, and they had to ask him to stop. Later on, he said. My hand just flared up on me. The right hand, the thumb, I couldn't grip the baseball. The guitar hero had just come out, and I fell in love with the game, dude. I'm a rock and roll fan. It's a killer <laughs> game. I was like, hell, I'm going to buy this. Guess I got hurt, dude. Just shredding too much on the plastic. I mean, you've got Mother on there. You've got Strutter on there. Fuck, there are some other really excellent ones on the first one. God, I love the guitar hero games. Yeah, I mean, guitar hero is fantastic. I mean, I, I really came into Guitar Hero, Guitar Hero 3. But either way, a lot of great stuff on Guitar Hero. High school me was obsessed with Guitar Hero. And 21-year-old pitcher Joel Zumaya also obsessed with Guitar Hero to the point where it did take him out of an ALCS. And you know, he, uh, <laughs> he said that he did end up in contact with the makers of Guitar Hero, uh, Harmonix, and that they were really cool and, quote, treated him well. But they did put him in the credits of the Xbox 360 version of Guitar Hero 2. It says, quote, No pitchers were harmed in the making of this game, except for one. Joel Zumaya. <laughs> he had it coming. What a shout out. It's great because in the PlayStation version, they just say there's no, uh, no drummers were hurt in the making of this game, except for one. He had it coming. But in the Xbox version, they specifically say pitchers and that Joel Zumaya had it coming. So now, he is the guy who missed the ALCS because he played Guitar Hero. Nothing fits better for a 21-year-old whose nickname was Zoom Zoom, who had flame tattoos on his arms and had celebrated the ALDS win by bringing a bunch of champagne onto the field with Curtis Granderson and spraying fans who were still left in the stadium. This is the most 21-year-old injury to pretty much ever occur. Joel Zumaya sounds like a great hang. There are other reasons why Joel Zumaya is probably a great hang. We'll get to that a little later. This part was fun. Unfortunately, this is not the only injury that Joel Zumaya suffers, or the only weird injury that Joel Zumaya suffers. Early in 2007, he suffered a ruptured tendon in the middle finger of his pitching hand. The doctor said it was because of the grip that he used to throw as hard as he did, and that he had never seen the injury in a pitcher before because it was only ever common when a football player would try to make a tackle and got their fingers caught in jerseys. So essentially he threw the ball so hard it was, at, it was like he got a football injury. He comes back and does pitch later in the season. But then in the offseason, in November of 2007, he gets injured again because he's helping his father move boxes out of the attic in their family home because a wildfire is approaching. It's Southern California. These things happen. And his father had a broken leg and wanted to get some boxes of personal items out of the attic in case they had to evacuate quickly. So Zumaya is carrying these heavy boxes, and a 50-pound box falls on his shoulder and separates his shoulder. So now he's out until June of 2008. Man, that sucks doing a chore because your dad broke his leg and then also severely injuring yourself. So even though he only appears on 21 games in all of 2008, he's responsible for 29.9% of all pitches thrown at 100 miles per hour or more. He was there for three weeks. My God. And, he still, and he still did that. 
This would continue a long trend for Zumaya. Needs shoulder surgery in 2009, corrected his elbow in 2010, and then needed to miss all of 2011 when the screw placed in his elbow during the elbow surgery needed to be replaced. And then in 2012, one month after agreeing to a deal with the Twins, he tore his UCL during batting practice and required Tommy John surgery. That's pretty much the end of Joel Zumaya's pitching career. Since he retired, he ended up having you know, a second career as a fisherman. He loved to do competitive bass fishing as an amateur, and that ended up opening his own commercial fishing business with his brother, Catching Tuna. He only does it by rod and hook. They do not use nets. They are against net fishing, which I am very, ha- very happy about. They're purists. And they're very love of the game. And so he, he stayed pretty low-key since then, but he has emerged to talk about two things, really, since then. One is rail on the Tigers' front office, and another is talk about smoking a lot of weed. <laughs> okay, Joel. So earlier this year, he posted a Facebook rant about how much the front office running the Tigers sucks, and that they need to clean house, they need to go through the main office and start removing some of these nerds that have no clue about the good old game of baseball. He talks about the standards of the good old English D and how it's iconic, comparing the 2022 Tigers to the 1962 New York Mets and how nobody should be spared accountability for how bad this is. And it looks like the most boomer Facebook post ever. It starts with about 12 of those zipper mad faces, adds four mind blowns about Alex Avila getting extensions as GM. It's pretty fantastic. It's a very boomer word to emoji ratio based on what you're telling me. It, it is pretty great. He didn't quite go full LeBron, but he's close. As for the drugs, though, as Harmon Tedesco might say, apparently in Ann Arbor, there's a thing called the Hash Bash, which is an annual event of civil disobedience that has been going on for 50 years, where thousands of attendees gather and smoke a ton of weed and argue for the decriminalization and then legalization of recreational marijuana. Now that it's legal in Michigan, uh, at least for the last three years, it's more of a party uh, type atmosphere. But this year, Zumaya was a speaker at the Hash Bash, where he talked about you know, the benefits of marijuana for pain control. So they fed Tylenol, aspirin, all those anti-inflammatories like candies down my throat. I smoked pot from 2006 all the way until I retired. He got a little more in-depth about that in a separate interview, where he would go home and vaporize medical marijuana until it, until, uh, it put him to sleep, and that more athletes should be allowed to smoke a ton of weed instead of having to take a bunch of painkillers. He also said that MLB tested him all the time because he was throwing 100 miles per hour plus, so they saw that he was smoking a ton of weed, but they only cared about cocaine, amphetamines, and PEDs, so they did, they did not give a shit that he was... Positive for marijuana every single time. Much like I think was pointed out when Michael Phelps had his whole moment, weed is not a performance-enhancing drug. If anything, it makes it more impressive. Unless you're Joey Chestnut. <laughs> Maybe if you're Joey Chestnut. <clears throat> so one, one other thing about this interview where he talked about smoking a lot of weed, he talked about how much he liked Jim Leyland and called him, quote, a small, pesky little hobbit, bro. I really like Joel Zamaya. He sounds like a really fun dude. And he still plays a lot of video games. He specifically likes Call of Duty a lot now. Like our friend Kyler Murray. So, bring it all full circle. I bet he could kick Kyler Murray's ass. I bet he could too. You know what? I, I just picture Joel Zamaya going out on his boats, catching some tuna, getting home after a long day. Probably got like a fisherman's tan. Just takes a really nice bong rip and then puts on his PlayStation and one shots people in Call of Duty and probably trash talks a shit ton during it. There's some poor middle schooler out there who had his entire night ruined because Jules and Maya got a 10 kill streak on him. <laughs> and then, you know, afterwards he'll post a rant on Facebook about, you know, how much the Tigers suck. But th- that that is the story of Joel Zumaya, the Weed-loving, Guitar Hero-loving, flamethrower, who maybe loved Guitar Hero too much and missed the ALCS because of it. Oh, there's no such thing. 
Uh, you, the words are just being taken out of my mouth left and right. No, that's an excellent guy. This is this is a, a fire trio. We've got, I'll admit, so somewhat partial to my boy Clint Malarchuk. We have a guy truly addicted to Guitar Hero to the point that it's stopped a pioneer of the 100 mile per hour fastball from being as well known as, you know, noted piece of shit or all his Chapman. And then we've got Napoleon McCallum, whose name already puts him into the conversation before he becomes just one of the single biggest panderers that Diaz has again brought to me in being a Navy boy, in being San Antonio and Baltimore sort of draft boy in some way. I, I am flummoxed as to how to go. Well, it's tough because, I mean, for me, there's two ways we always look at these, right? It's the merits based on the presentation and then the fitness as it relates to the category. And to me, like when you talk about catastrophic injuries in American sports, Millar Chuck's like right at the chop. Like you have Millar Chuck, Joe Theismann, Kevin Ware. Uh, Sean, with uh, Sean, Sean Livingston. Livingston. Sean Livingston. So, I mean, like, Malarchuk is like, I mean, really, if, if we're honoring the roots, like, Malarchuk had the first horrifically grotesque injury in, in the American sports consciousness, as far back as I can remember, at least. True. I, I would say, though, the category I don't think was what is the most catastrophic injury. You know, injuries of many different qualities are inflection points. All of the ones we discussed had major implications for the career whether it was career ending or merely like long-term clipping of the wing. So I don't know that anyone really distinguishes themselves that much in the category simply because these are all excellent injuries in their own different way. I say you play Ace of Spades on expert mode on Guitar Hero 1 to determine who should be the guy in Duck Tea this week. All right, Clint Malarchuk, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not confident about many things, Xavier, but I got you on that. Even right now, you think you, 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 think you can Even do Even right it? now, because honestly, left hand, I can hold that in an awkward position with the clavicle. You know, just I, for the confidence of it, I'm, go, I, I'm leaning towards Clint Malarchuk now. I, I, I like that <laughs> confidence. I think you would definitely get further than me. The second that I tried to go to hard mode and they were like, now you got to press five buttons. I was like, I have but four fingers. I, <laughs> that, that's all I got. I am but a man. Yeah, this is a tough one. Here's what I'll say. If it's a gruesome angle, neither of ours, Diaz, you and I, are more gruesome than the other. Those are equally gruesome. So yeah, if we want to go gruesome, we can cut out Joel Zumaya because I purposely did not go gruesome because I do not think I could have talked too much about, sure. gruesome, about gruesome. Sure. But if we want to narrow it that way, I'm fine narrowing that way because I enjoyed talking about this anyway. I loved hearing about Joel Zumaya. He is excellent. And if the thing is, if we're not trying to necessarily talk about a gruesome one, if it's just about like other inflection points, he's still fully in there. Because you've got, you know, we've talked about the six degrees of guy that we have with Napoleon McCallum, but you've also got an additional great butter guy effect with him talking about how that Raiders rushing future could have gone. You've got phenomenal butter guy effect with Joel Zumaya because all of those Detroit Tigers teams that break down, they always break down along their bullpen. That was the crux of every single one of that like 10 year run of Tigers teams in the end. They could not put away games in late inning. The pitching was so good, except for the bullpen. Yeah, I mean, like the Orioles faced three straight Cy Young winners and they won a series in a three game sweep because the bullpen had like a 27 ERA. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> so, like, my gut tells me we got to go with Malarchuk. It does tell me that. Malarchuk did make me take off my headphones in horror of the injury. So I, I am fine with that. If I were to try and like for myself, make one final advocacy for Clint Malarchuk, even just to convince myself now as both of you kind of go with it. Clint Malarchuk of all three of these had the biggest like journey back from an injury. The, the injury cast the largest shadow on his life i think of all of them like napoleon mccallum seems like he pretty quickly made peace with the this isn't happening anymore like clint malarchuk pushed himself to be back on the ice 10 days later right right and yeah just the like you said the fact that it so clearly has affected the course of his life yeah 
I mean, you you put it really well when you talked about how it's it is nonlinear healing. Like that was an excellent point. I think that you made initially. He is a very good example of of how this stuff sticks with you, even if you think you're past it. Right. I mean, and this is. Weeks like this are why we have relitigation. I would love to reconsider Zamaya on the merits. I would love to reconsider Napoleon on the merits. But I think so. But I, th- I think we have it. The last piece for him, Zelensky and the Ukrainian people were just named Times Person of the Year. And Glenn Malarchuk does have some proud Ukrainian heritage. It, it feels only right. It feels only right to welcome into the Hall of Guy. We're talking about... The cowboy between the pipes. It wasn't just the pipes that was red. It was also the ice there. Uh, But uh, it's okay (laughs) because he got back up on that horse. He got back in between those pipes. He stopped those pucks. He resembles all that we admire in our guys. He is Clint Malarchuk, and he is a guy. Welcome to the hall, Clint Malarchuk. Phew! Yeah, that was a heavy one. Uh, writing this out, particularly like writing about his suicide attempt, was was all very heavy. Again, you know, not to get too personal, but injuries are on my mind a lot. I should be fine in a few more months, but there, there's some, some bad thoughts and stuff. So it's been, I think, very cathartic for me. And uh, hopefully it hasn't been too gruesome for any of you, beautiful listeners. And hey, if it's provided any catharsis to you, all the better. We're here to purge and to heal, baby to purge and to heal we're here to continue to root on france and argentina in the world cup xavier do either of us want i'll gladly call the shot once again argentina still fine by monday i will also call the shot that france will beat england and then will be fine in the semifinal against whoever they play i will not besiege yet another country with my <laughs> would you mind picking portugal just real quick yeah, you know, I just think they're the team of destiny. You know, Cristiano. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Portugal all the way. They got a Euro and it's time to get a world. You heard it here first, folks. We could not be more confident that the deserving Portuguese national team is definitely not going to have any issues in their matchup against Morocco. And that's all we've got this week, y'all. I've been James. I've been... Number one FCS playoffs fan. Let's go Sacramento State Hornets. Special guest, Xavier. And I'm Diaz. And as the great Argentinian commentator, Andres Cantor, will often exclaim, Go!